Hello. Could I open that seminar on March 6, 2023? It's our greatest pleasure to have Mosher Contractor today, uh, who will talk about people analytics. So in the socio-cultural spectrum from social computational social science on one end and cultural products, including texts on stones and images on photo plates. This is on the people end. <laughs> People analytics using digital exhaust to leverage network insights in the algorithmically infused workplace. It is our special pleasure to have Nosher because um, he is one of the pioneers of true multidisciplinarity. He's a computational social scientist known for, known for that. He has a very, very long history in network science. He was one of the first organizers of the WebSci conference. Uh, currently is the president of the International Communications Association. And um, anybody who knows his work uh, is super fascinating by the broad spectrum and the excellence of uh, each individual thing, including, and this is very relevant for us here at Cultural Data Analytics Kudan project in team science, which um, is obviously an issue in um, multidisciplinary research as people have very different traditions, different publication venues, different languages, even different modes of thinking. And um, Mosher has worked on all of these kind of aspects in one way or another. So with that, I, I just give the stage to you, Mosher, and um, um, stage is all yours. As usual, our typical format is like 40 minutes talk, 80 minutes discussion, uh, but it's really up to you. You can use the two hours however you want, and we can also make it shorter if you like. Thank you very much. So, so just that those numbers again, you said how much for the talk and how much for the discussion? It's like one third talk, two thirds discussion, 40 ah, minutes. Okay. If you like, but if you, okay, if no, you no, 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 we can, can yeah. for two hours. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 you know, I, uh, obviously I have enough slides on the other hand, it's much more interesting for me to have the discussion. So, um, I, I don't know how, first of all, uh, to, uh, in formal terms, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I've looked at your speaker list that you have had. And even though I've not had a chance to attend any of the on the prior sessions, I wish I had the time to attend those because those are some amazing speakers that you have lined up there. So I am very humbled to be in such good company. But I think congratulations to you for putting together an amazing um, constellation of really uh well-known intellectuals and also representing a lot of different diverse perspectives, which I think uh, is consistent with um, the ethos, as I understand it, of Kudan. So uh, kudos to Kudan for doing all of that stuff. And um, um, I'm happy, I'm, I'm really happy to have a chance to talk with you. I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, with what I was told and I've experienced to some extent firsthand the uh, the different styles in which people give talks at universities and at the University of Chicago, um, when I gave a talk there, uh, I was warned before the talk that if people didn't ask questions in the first three to five minutes, uh, then that was a sign that they really didn't care much about your talk. Um, and that uh, people were constantly interrupting you and constantly asking you questions. Now, I'm not recommending that we adopt that culture here, but I will invite questions along the way so that um, it's, it you don't need to say, oh, well, let me let him finish and then I'll ask the question. Just jump in anytime you want with any question, not just clarification, but even other types of questions. Because uh, if you want to keep it as interactive as was mentioned, I think that would be really a good way to uh, uh, to encourage that. And so I'm coming to you today from Jakarta, where it's a little after seven o'clock in the evening. And uh, I'm here because as I was mentioning earlier, that um, we are uh, kicking off the first regional chapter ever for the International Communication Association. So the idea is to have a sustained presence in different parts of the world. and the one that is happening tomorrow is actually the first ever for ICA. So uh, that's that's what brought me here to, uh, to Jakarta for this. But for tonight, the more important event is to help um, tonight year, afternoon for you, uh, is to uh, talk a little bit about this notion of people analytics. Um, and I'll introduce the term a little bit. For, I'm, I'm not sure many of you have heard of it. Um, yeah, but I'll introduce it, then I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by algorithmically 
uh, infused uh, societies in general, and then talk about some of the work that we've done in this area. Um, and as was advertised just now, uh, many of the examples that I'll be talking about will in fact come from the area of team science. So that could be of uh, interest uh, to uh, to many of you, even though the teams that I'm looking at may not be exactly the kinds of cultural production teams that I know many of you have been focusing on. Okay, so let me see if I can get this to work. So people analytics, what is people analytics? So this was a term that essentially was popularized by Google starting in the um in i would say the mid 21st uh, in the mid uh, uh 2015 approximately in that time period and the idea was that you know we, yeah we the this particular article i think summarized it well by talking about the fact that the geeks arrive in hr uh people analytics is here so that i like the phrase the old-fashioned fuddy-duddy hr department is changing the geeks have arrived and this idea of the of the geeks being the ones who are controlling, um, you know, who have taken over HR was further was further um, popularized by Google actually having a big study which they did calling and talking about how they were using people analytics to completely reinvent HR. So this was a summary from the New York Times of a study of what Google learned from its quest to build the perfect team. Um, and what they did was they spent two years studying 180 teams and then they tried to identify what is the most successful traits that these 180 teams had. And they came up with five of the top traits. And you will see that the top trait of all is uh, something called psychological safety, which is a very well-known concept, which basically says that in order for people in teams to be successful and to be effective in teams, each person on the team should feel very comfortable, uh, not feeling that they would be blamed for anything or someone will point fingers at them. And so if they feel that they're in a psychologically safe environment, that in the long term will lead to better ways of being able to be successful in teams. Uh, someone noted that um, they were asked when they did the study that how come um, the, the technical quality or the expertise of people doesn't seem to be one of the five categories that would explain the top teams. You would think that having smart people on your team would make a difference. And the response they received was, well, uh, remember this study was done at Google and everyone at Google is smart. So there was no variance in that. And it, that may apply to other uh, companies, but at least in the case of Google, that was not an issue that they were too concerned about. Uh, the continuing drum roll of how important people analytics continued, the hype was building. McKinsey published his article also around the same time in 2015, said power to the new people analytics. Uh, Deloitte had another report called People Analytics Recalculating the Route. But one of the things that they raised, which I think was important, is that their study found that only 9% of companies believed that they had a good understanding of what talent dimensions drive performance. So if people analytics is saying, I, I should be able to look at people, analyze what metrics I can and tell you who will be successful, they were not having very much success. And there was another study that was done around the same time. This one was published by Tata Consulting Services. And what they, they titled the article, HR Analytics, no longer just a buzzword, but they also had a depressing finding because what they found was that just 5% of big data investments go to HR, the group that typically manages people analytics. So what this basically means is that even though there's a lot of hype, A, uh, the, the results so far don't give us much optimism about what exactly is driving uh, talent and success in teams, and B, that for all the hype, the actual amount of dollar investment in this area is very small. It's only 5% as compared to all the other areas that are clearly benefiting from big data investments. So on the basis of this, uh, my collaborator, Paul Leonardi, who's on the faculty at UC Santa Barbara uh, in their technology management program, Paul and I published this article in 2018 that we titled Better People Analytics, uh, Measure Who They Know, Not Just Who They Are, which of course is a very is not so subtle way of saying we need to take into account networks, not just the individual attributes of the people. And in this article, we said, you know, on the one hand, people analytics tends to look at individual straight data and state data and aggregate data. We were suggesting that we need to combine these kinds of attribute analytics with what we call relational analytics, where we look at the network 
um, data, both individual network, team network, and organizations network. And we compared it in the we made an analogy to what happens when you think about you know, using a microscope to study patterns in the brain. And if you look at the control brain on the left, you'll see the patterns are different from the brain uh, MRIs on the right, which is of a person afflicted with schizophrenia. Except that in the case of networks, we said rather than using a microscope, what you really need to do is think about it as a macroscope, which means that you have to zoom out. Because if you zoom in too much, what you see is a picture like this that doesn't show you anything. But as you begin to zoom out, you see again that as in a pointless tradition, you know, you're able to see something really pretty and you see a pattern, but only if you zoom out enough. Um, we argue in this HBR article that in many ways networks is a very similar thing where we are looking to zoom out so that we can see the forest for the trees and that we are in particular looking for what we call structural signatures. And these structural signatures will allow us, or you can, some people call them motifs, um, will allow us to see certain patterns that will allow us to gain insights. And the insights that we can gain from these structural signatures can be at the individual level, the team level, or the organizational level. Of course, we're talking here about looking at it in the context of organizations, and that's why we talked about these three levels. The, in the article, we give some examples of these signatures. Two of them are at the individual level, the top two on the left. And then we have two at the team level, the one on the top right, the one at the bottom left. And then the last two out here are at the organizational level. The first one the, on the top left is at the individual level. And we say that if you look at the purple node, you can see that by virtue of its structural signature, that purple node is very likely to come up with good ideas. And the reason that purple node is likely to come up with good ideas is because they're connected to nodes that are not connected to each other. And so they are uniquely positioned to take these different ideas from different people, combine them in creative ways and come up with good ideas. Um, in the second one here on the, in the middle and the top is the influence signature. And by this, we are saying that the purple node out here is the one that will be very influential. So this is a node that is likely to have a high degree of influence in the overall network. And your first instinct might say, how could this node be so influential when it only has two links? But the idea of influence is not the number of direct links that you have, but the number of links that are, that the number of uh, nodes that your nodes are connected to. So in other words, if you have two links, how many are each of those two people connected with and how many are those people connected with, which of course, in network terms, we know as essentially the eigenvector uh, measure of prestige and very similar to Google's page rank algorithm, which is how they sort you. The search results in Google are so sorted by the top search result not being the website that has the relevant content that has the most links coming to it, but in fact, the website that has the most links coming to it from websites that have the most links coming to them from websites that have the most link coming to them. And it is that uh, sort of uh, circular definition that provides a measure of, of true influence rather than just looking at the direct eyes. The top right here is now moving away from individual signatures to team structural signatures. And the one on the right says that this team is likely to be very efficient in getting things done because the members on the team all know each other very well and get along well. If you look at the, uh, but that doesn't mean that they will be very creative. It just means that they will be efficient. If you look at the bottom left, you see the what is called as the innovation signature. Here, the team is likely to be innovative, not because of the connections they have amongst themselves, but the connections they have on the outside. Notice that the team members here all are connected to different people on the outside who are not connected to each other. So just like it was true for ideation, where a person would be good at ideating uh, if they connect to people or not connected, here the team is likely to be good at innovating if the members of the team are tapping people on the outside that are not overlapping with those tapped by the other members of the team. And so that gives you a lot of innovative ideas coming in. And then finally, at the organizational level, we talked about a measure that we all know in networks, and it's the measure of how siloed the organization is. So in this case, you see that most of the ties within each color are, and yeah, all the nodes in a certain color are mostly connected to themselves with very few connections outside. 
this we networks recognize is a measure of modularity that says the extent to which your ties are connected only are you know are within your own uh, sort of sub communities and not cutting across those communities and then finally on the right hand side we have a very interesting signature that came out of my own work that i did with procter and gamble many years ago which shows how if you're a supplier and you are connected to a lot of people within the organizations who don't talk to each other, then what happens is, is uh, on the outside, you have a real advantage because in the best case scenario for this organization, that you as a supplier might be double billing or triple billing the organization by giving the same thing to many of them and each of them are paying you separately because they don't know that each of them is doing so. Uh, and that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that this supplier actually has really unique information from different parts of the company and has the opportunity to combine it and come up with a competitive product that defeats the company itself because they are not, because the people in the company are not talking to each other. So as a result, uh, we call this the vulnerability signature, the extent to which the organization is vulnerable to someone from the outside. Okay, so first of all, I've gone through these signatures very quickly. Uh, there's nothing exhaustive about this list. These There are many, many, many more signatures one can come up with. And more importantly, none of these signatures is something that we made up or is unique to what we are saying. All of these signatures is based on decades of social network research that has been done. So there's nothing new or novel in this article. And then the question you might ask yourself as well, if it's not new or novel, why on earth did you decide to write the article? And why on earth did HBR decide to publish an article that is made up of such old, well-known facts that is not new? And the reason we think that that is important is because in this article, we raised this big issue that why is it that if we know all these network insights, why are they not being used more? And we blame the fact that we rely on that networks in the past, at least in organizational context, have relied primarily on survey data. And when you rely on survey data, what that really means is you have to live with the fact that it is very time consuming. The response rates tend to be very low. People don't answer surveys. And finally, they get obsolete pretty quickly. And so you have to do a new survey if you want to keep up with it. And we say, as a result, you have a situation where all of these people are not very, you know, you're not going to be able to um, uh, use so, uh, network insights if the data that you're going to get is not very good. So what if we were to have a scenario where we could get survey data at a minimal cost with 100% response rate updated 24 seven? And of course, we imagine that that would be a very attractive proposition, but in a sense, we are already now have the opportunity to see if we can do that. And that's where the digital exhaust part of this project comes up, or digital trace or digital exhaust comes in. Because increasingly, a lot of what we do is being captured digitally. Uh, at least the metadata, who we're talking with, um, how long we're talking with them, how much interaction we have with them, how quickly we reply to them. And even when we have face-to-face -face meetings, we often have calendar invitations that tell us the people that we've had face-to-face -face meetings with. So there's an enormous amount of digital trace data that we're generating. So we began to ask this question in the article that what if we could leverage this digital trace data to in place of surveys to help us better understand organizations. And my personal uh, line in this was that we were sort of sitting on the border between what I would call network science and network science fiction, because <laughs> that had never been done before. And so we were really trying to see if there was something that could be done to take all this kind of digital trace data that we have and look at these traces, whether it's an employee sending a message to someone, a file to someone, a badge to someone, a like to someone, an email to someone, and so on and so forth. Um, because one of the things that, of course, is very rich about this data is that we get all these different forms of digital interaction with each other. That's the good news. That's also the bad news. Because if you look at networks that uh, so networks research that has been done, the networks research has focused on network relationships like who do you seek advice from, who do you enjoy working with, who do you see as a hindrance, um, and there's a big difference between taking all these, in, you know, how do you get at whether I look to Max for leadership, 
by simply looking at all this metadata that we have here, which is at a much more micro level, like how many me how many messages did I send them? When did I like something that he did? Did I follow it? Did I mention it? And so the challenge was, is there a way of statistically taking these raw ingredients of data that we've just described here and being able to bundle them up in a way that will predict what I would say about the extent to which I look to leadership to a person or the, how much I enjoy working with that person or who do I seek advice from or who I might see as a hindrance in that context. So that was really the challenge we took. And so the first project that we did in this area with the, some of my colleagues at Northwestern, as well as uh, at uh, Fudan University in uh, Shanghai, uh, was we began to see whether we could go into organizations, persuade them to give us their digital trace data, as well as their and they allow us to survey them and then see if we are able to build statistical models that allow us to take the digital trace data and see how well we can predict what they said on surveys. And so this is the first one we did was, this was before the pandemic. We collected data from, in this particular case, uh, 66 all 66 employees at a Chinese company uh, that used an enterprise social media platform that you can see the platform below. It was fairly similar as compared to some of the ones we're used to in the US and in Europe. Um, and so our goal was we took digital trace data, we took survey data, and we wanted to see if we could map the two together. The survey data were questions like, this person provides me the sense of purpose. Who do you rely on for leadership? Who do you go for help or advice on work? And then we used a set of uh, techniques called exponential random graph models that allow us to take all of that digital trace data that we have and see how best we can estimate parameters that weight many of these different uh, predictors to see how well we could predict the survey data, which would be things like who do you seek advice from and so on and so forth. Now, the mo models themselves were fairly complicated, but before I show you a table with all of the, some of those results, the nice thing about these models is because they are statistical models which are easily interpretable, you can look at every single parameter coefficient and be able to come up with log odds or and then um, sort of odds ratio uh, interpretations. And so if, if you are looking at, you know, who provides you with a sense of purpose, our data would show us things like if an employee sends someone one message per day, they're going to be 15.2% times more likely to say that person provides them with a sense of purpose. And if employees send someone 10% more messages than they receive from that person, then they are 26.7 times more likely to say that that person provides them with a sense of purpose compared to a pair of people with an even split of messages either way. So this is the kinds of models that we ran. You can see there are lots of different parameters that we are estimating in this case, um, including you know things like how quickly you reply to someone. That also, if I send a message to you and then you reply within two hours, that's a very different signal than two weeks, for example. And so what we were doing was, I, 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 there are many of these kinds of models we ran. I'm not going to go into the detail, but uh, I'm not going to go to each one of them. The results were fairly similar. And more importantly, in every single case, we found that we were actually doing a pretty good job of being able to take that digital trace data and predict what people would say on a survey. So in this case, the accuracy, which is a little misleading, was 89% uh, for predicting which person provides you with a sense of purpose. But even if you look at the precision recall plot and the area under the curve on the top, on the bottom right side of the graphic, you see that these models actually did quite well, which is both good and bad from my point of view. It is good from a modeling point of view that we're able to get these kinds of data so we don't have to burden people by asking them to complete surveys if these models are going to do a fairly good job of predicting. I think it's also a little bad or a little troubling because I personally didn't feel comfortable that my digital trace data was being so easily mined to know exactly what I think of people without me having to actually be surveyed about it. So I had mixed feelings about it from a personal point of view. But the bottom line is that for all of these, we've asked the question, can we predict survey network data responses using digital trace data? 
And the bottom line is we can, not great, but but definitely good enough to get started in this area. So we were now definitely moving, edging away from this notion that I'd said of network science fiction and moving more into network science itself in this case. But one of the things to remember about these digital traces is that it is not simply a mirror of the connections that we have. It changes the connections that we have. And how does it change the connection? One of the ways in which these social, and especially social media, like Slack, like Teams, like Zoom, that we're on right now, that one of the ways in which it changes the networks is it helps us get a sense of many different kinds of affordances, like who knows who, who knows what. And so there is a whole body of literature that has been developed over the last decade, looking at what are the affordances that these new technologies are providing us. Um, when we do email, we don't necessarily see a lot of this stuff unless we decide to CC everyone else. Uh, but in emails tend to be fairly private. But if you think even on what we do on Facebook or LinkedIn or Slack or Teams, when we post something, a lot of people in that area might see it. Uh, I know who's commenting on it. I know I can see who liked it. I can see who may not have liked it. I can see uh, what goes on back and forth on the on the conversations on each of these postings. And as a result, now I have a much richer understanding of the network. I now know who really likes whom because I saw whether someone liked someone else's post and whether someone was critical of someone else's post. Uh, and so th uh, there's a whole set of affordances that I'm not going to go into in great detail, but suffice it to say that there is research showing that the use of enterprise social media are not simply serving as sort of passive conduits for our social networks, but by their very virtue, they are shaping social networks. They are changing our networks by changing our perceptions of who knows what and who knows who. And that, that's like, and that is shown to change the perceptions of people in the network. Now, while there's been a lot of attention focused on this, an area that I think is becoming more and more relevant in the workplace is not just technological affordances, but algorithmic affordances. And as this cartoon shows, the algorithmic affordance is different from the normal technological affordance by actually telling you what to do, by telling you who are the people you should talk to, et cetera. So the same idea that was applied to uh, that Amazon and Netflix and companies like that have been applying to recommend you know, products to you or movies to you, or in the case of uh, Facebook, you see that they are actually deciding which posts are going to be at the top of your newsfeed. And that same issue is happening now within the context of the workplace. And so one of the new areas of research that I think is still only in this uh, latent nascent stage in, 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 the, in the work context is how do we study organizations when one of the actors, if you may, I, I use the word actors loosely, is uh, an algorithm that is changing what you might be doing by virtue of it making a recommendation to you or to your team. And one area where that gets played out a lot is in the context of, um, of teams. So this, these were two articles that I had the pleasure of co-authoring. Uh, one was called Me Measuring Algorithmically in Free Society, because what I've described in the workplace of course, applies outside the workplace. And so while the article in Nature talked more generally about algorithmically infused societies, my focus for the talk today is really on the algorithmically infused workplace, because that itself is a big enough challenge to take rather than taking on society at large. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about these in a, in a few contexts here by starting with some examples of what happens when we try to do algorithmic nudges uh, what happens when we try to do informational nudges, and you'll see some examples in that area. But before I go into these examples, I've spoken for quite a while, so I'll pause and to see if anyone had any questions or comments or reactions before I continue. Hello, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think it's super inspiring. Um, anybody who has a question, raise your hand, um, and you can also like put it in chat. Who's who's there? So I give the word to Mike. 
Yeah. Yeah, basically, just switch off the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, uh, basically, I have a small technical question. As far as I understood, uh, you had this survey of well, the, the 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 data from a firm which has like sixty six employers or something like this. Yes, and uh, you constructed a very multi-parameter model of of predicting different things. And and the question is, how reliable can sure. Uh, how how yeah. it is possible to infer anything yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so complicated out of the data for sixty six people? Yeah. So uh, I I I I thank you for that question. It's a very legitimate question, and I don't think that I mentioned this. I mentioned it only in passing. I said this was the I had mentioned that this was the first place where we had collected the data, and so I was using that. But in fact, um, when we began to do this, we we have since then collected the data from two other organizations in China and four other organizations in the US. And so we have large, much larger data sets. Uh, the last, the most recent data set that we have actually has over 1200 employees. Uh, and uh, also the data comes from Slack. And so in all of these cases, we found that the, the specificity of the models vary because the, in somewhat it depends on the platforms they're using. But what we have done, and I didn't talk about it today, even in this particular context, is that we have actually spent time doing both um, what I what what in machine learning terms we would call you know um, training data sets and test data sets to see to what extent we can have n four validation of the model on built with a subset of the data and then to see how well it predicts the other data. In fact, in in this same organization that I was describing those results to you, we were able to do the same study as for as a year later, and we used the models that we built for the first round of data to see how well we could predict what happened in the second round of data. And the answer is yes. So when I was being, when I, I gave you as an example, only the very first uh, small sample of the data set, but that was not the basis on which we are making all of these inferences. So thank you for the, giving me a chance to clarify that. Mark? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. It's, it's really exciting. So it's probably, in, uh, I had a question about the ethical part and it's probably not the moment to get stuck on it, but I will still ask it that, uh, so okay, so one one hand is that, okay, how how it will be applied, but uh, I'm more curious about the, so the data you used, the uh, sort of digital traces. So if, if I think that, uh, uh, so if you get only the sort of relations between the peoples in companies, I guess it is more, uh, you know, easy, easier to get and work with than if you would have, for example, like all, uh, you know, all of the actual data, all of their emails, etc. So it's like, how does it kind of map on the level of how ethical, how easily accessible it is to actually apply yeah. it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's of course that that is such an important question. So that the article in HBR, we actually had a separate box section where we talk about the ethical issues because that is an important issue. Now there are lots of interesting issues related to the ethical part of this mark. One is in organizations. Technically, the way people's uh, contracts are signed, when you work on a platform that is provided by the organization, they actually, in principle, have the right to all the data that you have. So they have the ability to look at everything that you're doing within that context. That doesn't make it ethical, but it does make it, for the most part, legal for them to have access to that data. And we talk a lot about what are the issues involved in it. And in most cases, organizations will not look at it, will not be, will not want to do it for good reason. Uh, one of the ways in which we discuss this in the HBR article also is to say, what if we were, one, one, one uh, strategy that we recommend is to make the networks that we obtain for an individual available to that individual. Uh, what do I mean by that? In other words, it's like the, the metaphor that we use is at least in the United States, uh, you there are certain companies that are giving you credit ratings based upon your financial transactions. Um, and so, uh, and you have the right to go to the company to say, tell me what my credit rating is. And that way, you know how you know what, how you stand, and that certainly helps you. For example, to get uh, uh, loans if you want to buy a house or a car, they always check your credit rating to know how reliable you are to 
to be make sure that you'll be paying back the money that you're borrowing or and so on. And, and so we do that. But the reason we are doing that is twofold. One is we think that giving individuals a reflection, a picture, a characterization of their network, including specifically providing them a report that tells them based on the network we see, here is what you, how good you are likely to be with coming up with new ideas. The, the, the signatures that I mentioned, the ideation signature, the influence signature. So it's almost, uh, and I say this only somewhat tongue in cheek, it's like one of those cosmopolitan quizzes that you might do online where you answer a bunch of questions and it tells you something about yourself or a personality test and it tells you something about yourself. It's along those lines, but also quite unique because most people have never seen anything like this before, right? Because it's a relatively novel thing. Uh, we compare it to uh, others, other sort of metrics that are developed at the individual level that are often uh, called, um, in other words, your, what are your strengths? Because very often we have a tendency to focus on our weaknesses. And in this case, the argument is you don't need to focus. If you're not very good in terms of coming, with the, uh, coming up with ideas, don't sweat that a lot because not everyone needs to be the one coming up with ideas. If on the other hand, you see that your strengths are in the area of uh, influencing people, then capitalize on your strengths. So there is another book uh, that uses the same idea. It's called the Strength Finders book. And it basically makes the argument, don't waste time on your weaknesses because you could spend a lot of time on it and make only a marginal improvement. Instead, when you get scores like this, look at what your strengths are and then just essentially capitalize on those. So, we, so the one way in which we make this more ethically uh, acceptable and uh, to employees is providing them with their own data, providing them with some insights based on it, some actionable insights based on it. And that way they will feel that they are not being essentially preyed on in this way. The second advantage of sharing this data with them is also, is also related to the credit analogy that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and that is, be, this data could sometimes be very wrong, right? Because as you said, this is digital trace data. This data can be noisy that we know from our own work and everyone else's work that very often th these accounts that you are looking at, um, it could be that a single person has two accounts and you consider those as two separate people, or you have a single email account or a single uh, social media account, but it's being used by multiple people. So in other words, oh. there's a lot of noisiness in these data. And as a result of the noisiness, it is not something that you can count on as being very good. So where does the person come in? If you came in, Mark, and said, look, you sent me a picture of my network. I didn't recognize that. That's not my network. You must have made a mistake somehow, or you, mix, you mixed me up with some other mark or something along those lines. So it provides a built-in way for us to also be uh, have the opportunity or a structured way of making sure that we have access to errors that we might be committing. And that's what the credit rating does, right? So if you go to a credit rating company and all of a sudden you find that your credit rating is terrible, you, you have the right to go to them and say, look, I think you've got something wrong. Somebody else must have impersonated me and taken out uh, and done bad fiscal behavior based on my name and my social security number, but that's not me. So the same I think could work out here. So I and I, I do end, end the slide deck and we probably won't get to it, but I do at the end of the slide deck talk some about ethics. And what I will say is that both, I mentioned the HBR article, but the same thing is also, we take, we take that very seriously in the context of the article in, that we published in, in Nature. And so I would also recommend you to take a look at that. And my closing slide on this, on this particular slide deck, which as I said, we may not get to, is about exactly that issue. That what I'm talking about in today's presentation is that we can do this. But just because we can do it, it doesn't mean we should do it. And that's where a lot of these ethical issues come into play. And that is, you know, what are the what are the ways in which we um, will be able to uh, be transparent about the errors, the limitations of what we are seeing? Remember, one of the big topics today in these technology discussions is that we don't live on only one platform. Sometimes people thought we lived only on one platform. 
<laughs> but even that is changing now with Twitter, but certainly within the context of the organizations, there are multiple platforms. And one of the big areas of research is how do we tap into networks that is across different platforms, right? So that's a big area of research. Uh, and I can tell you that the Chinese example that I just gave you, I remember talking to people in the organizations when we were debriefing with them on the results and privately they would tell me, they go, yeah, you kind of got what we talked about, but honestly, if there was something really sensitive we wanted to discuss, we would not do it on the company's platform. We would use WeChat for that. And we had a separate WeChat channel, which of course is, as you may know, is is very popular in China and as sort of equivalent to WhatsApp. But uh, they they themselves told me they said, well, if there's something really sensitive, we know we will not talk about it on on the on the company platform because we know the company has access to that. At the end of the day, it may not use it, but it has access to it. And so, under those circumstances, we'll go elsewhere. There, right there, you know that some of the most sensitive discussions, some of the most important discussions, we're losing completely access or a window into those because those never happen on the platform we observed so i don't know whether i'm answering your question but i'm i'm certainly echoing the concern that you're raising and recognizing that that has to be an important step in some ways i think that's much tougher to deal with than some of the modeling uh sort of successes that we've had here thank you very much i have another question too um it goes uh, a little bit further back in your slide deck, which is yeah. uh, to do with the structural signatures. Yeah. Um, so one of the interesting things, uh, and this is also related to what Mark just asked, is there may be things in the data that are surprising. And so um, the things you mentioned in these structural signatures, as you pointed out, they're very old school sort of measures of uh, social networks. But at the same time, you're also part of NICO, the Northwestern Institute for Complexity Science. And uh, as such, you're just as much as we are uh, interested in emergent phenomena, which we may not even know. So there may be structural signatures, which yeah. are either more frequent than we expect or more, uh, less frequent than yeah. we expect. Yeah. So um, is there a way you systematically forage for that? Yeah, so you're you're talking about um, I you know I, I was very tempted. I mean, obviously in our field. For, by the way, if you're interested in that, uh, if you're interested in that topic, one of the things that I found quite amusing is a slide um, that uh, it's a website, interactive website, uh, where somebody networks and clearly had quite a lot of time on his or her hand, um, created a periodic table of individual network metrics. It's mm -hmm. hilarious. It's it's at least as complex as the mentally periodic table, if not more so. And it just gives you so many different measures. And, and these are all in a sense structural signatures because there are literally all of these are different published measures at the individual level to understand it. And, and I, I always caution my students in class that we'll never be able to be comprehensively covering it exactly for the reason you mentioned. And that is people are constantly coming up with new measures, new structural signatures. We haven't even talked today at all, but you know, just like we have different individual network metrics, um, in the last decade, there have also been ways of looking at dynamic measures of network centrality, for example, of what happens when you have network data over time and you're trying to look at centrality is not simply being you know what it was at each point in time, but li literally looking to see, can you abstract from a stream of data how central a person is in those different contexts. So the the all of that will continue, right? Places like Nico, but everywhere else, people, your lab and others are going to continue working on that. One of the challenges that I have become acutely aware is that there is such a huge gap between network research and the application of networks in the real world that we have to be very, very careful to make to only provide the simplest of baby steps to the practitioners so that we don't run the risk of overwhelming them. Almost every time that I've tried to present something in the context of practitioners, I have always been slapped on the wrist and said, that is way too technical. People out there know so little about these issues that if you have any hope of success, you need to be very, very, very basic. 
and and then you know you, you, it's think of it as the gateway drug you're just trying to get them you just trying to get them into the network chamber and then after that there'll be plenty of time and decades where you can work on the more uh, advanced metrics and so i i think that they are absolutely right having also been involved in a startup company that i co-founded with a former student it's i my experience with clients was exactly the same thing uh we cannot we have to keep separate in our mind the advances we are doing in the research lab and then what exactly we are sharing in that public space. So that's my sort of um, words of wisdom to be cautious about not getting excited about what we're doing in the research and then immediately trying to take that into the field. Now, I could be wrong, but that's been that's my hunch that we have to be very careful of what we actually do in that context. Nice. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me then, I don't see any other hands, so let me continue for a few more minutes, but please, you know, I'll stop again, but in the meantime, if you want to think of it, please do uh, jump in with uh, other questions. These are fantastic questions. I loved all each of them, and it gave us an opportunity to think about some of these issues, which I might not have otherwise said. So uh, what I what I will do is if we have if time permits, I'll give for the rest of my talk, I'll give examples of what we've been doing in these four different contexts, all of them having to do with teams. Um, the first one is the one I think that I might might spend the longest time on and we may have the most chance to discuss it. And that's the notion of team self-assembly. So what do we mean by self-assembly? Self-assembly are teams where people, will essentially go about trying to choose who they want to work with. And they invite people and people might say yes. So when we work on articles, we often do that. You know, we will say, oh, I'd like to write an article. Um, you know, like uh, I'd like to collaborate with you on this. I might have some interesting data or I have some interesting questions or I have access to a company. However, if people start out, but they do these collaborations. Sometimes you're looking for people from different disciplines, different geography. Um, and so on and so forth. Those are called self-assembled teams. The next category is called team staffing. And by that, I mean teams that are where people don't assemble themselves into team. They are assigned into teams. That assigning into teams could be done by a manager. It could be done by an algorithm, right? So we have all, all those, I mean, the entire gamut. Uh, in our classes, we often will assign people randomly into teams. We'll say, yeah, I want, you know, whoever's sitting in class, so I'm going to take the first, sixth, uh, first, sixth, eleventh, sixteenth person and put them into a team and then do the same thing for, you know, on a, a random basis. Or I might have some strategy by which I want to put people together. Um, I might want to create teams that are gender balanced or teams that are balanced across different majors or undergraduate uh, areas of specialization and so on and so forth. So, um, and then of course, you know, the other area where team staffing is very important um, and is that for a lot of the work that I did on self-assembly, when I would present it to people at the Department of Defense or at NASA, they said, well, all the self-assembly work is cute, it's nice, but in the army, we don't self-assemble. We staff people on who's going to go fight a war. And likewise, when we send people on a space mission, astronauts don't self-assemble and decide who's going to go with whom we decide who what the crew is going to be for a particular mission so there is definite relevance to staffing that needs to be taken into account so let's start first with the uh, with the notion of self-assembly so you know here is if i were to ask you for a show of hands and i'm not going to but if i were to ask you uh for a show of hands how many of you have had experience being on dream teams um, I think that um, a few of you will raise your hands and say, yep, I've been on a dream team. Uh, but at least what I will say is, uh, without putting your lab on the spot, what I'll <laughs> say is that if I ask other people uh, um, in, in large audiences, when I ask people, okay, you've, so many of you have raised your hands saying you've been on a dream team. Now, those, now raise your hands if at any point you've been on a nightmare team. And inevitably, there'll be many, many more hands that will go up for a nightmare team than for a dream team, because many more of us have had experience in that area. And then we ask ourselves the questions, how did we get here, which is the, the nightmare team, et cetera. So the goal is, you know, how can we figure out a little bit more about why some of our teams, why we often don't end up with the dream team and end up on the nightmare team? So this is research done by three of my former students, Marlon and Diego, both uh, did their dissertations on this uh, data that I'm going to talk about. 
And Jackie, who is now an assistant professor at HBS, also worked on this project when she was a PhD student in my lab. And then my collaborator on all of these um, is Leslie De Church, who obviously brings a lot more background on research on teams and IO psych, because that's her background. Um, and so um, this is a team that I self-assembled or we self-assembled to study the self-assembly of teams. So uh, we asked ourselves, you know, as we think about uh, people inviting other people, and you can ask yourself this question right now as we're having this conversation, how do you decide who to bring on your team? Who do you reach out to? And when you get an invitation from someone, uh, how do you decide whether to say yes or no to that in, uh, to that invitation? And if we think about it, there are it's a we can think of a two by two where when we are trying, we can one access the vertical axis is the one I described, where some teams are self-assembled at the bottom and other teams are staffed. But if you look at the horizontal axis, the one on the left end tells you more of what is being done in this space by individuals finding other individuals, as opposed to on the right hand side, this being done for you by algorithms. And that's a lot of what we are trying to focus on in this particular context. And you get, you can do each of those. So the one we are talking about, normally what we do is at the bottom left corner. We self-assemble into teams. Uh, we don't use any technology. We just go around in our head. We have an idea of who does what, or we heard a talk. We heard someone give a talk. And I thought, oh, that could be interesting, you know. I'm, and then, the, for, for example, I'm thinking specifically of the collaboration that we have started working on here between Sonic and Kuda. And that's how we began, you know. I heard a talk that you were giving, and then I had some ideas about how we might be able to analyze the data differently. Uh, you folks thought that was an interesting approach to think about it not one that you would normally think about, so we decided to collaborate. So that's an example of how we self-assemble the teams. We didn't use the algorithms to tell us what it is. Now, if you think about it, though, an area where we have had a lot of success using algorithms to link people together has been dating platforms. And uh, whether it's eHarmony or Match or any of these, it has been enormously successful. And so the metaphor that I keep saying is that if we have been a lot, we have found algorithms to be so effective in helping us in our dating spaces. How come we don't think about using those same kinds of algorithms to help us form teams? And uh, that is in effect what we began to do out here. So we created this platform called My Dream Team uh, that we developed at Northwestern. It's been used now, you know, thousands of times by different. Uh, people who have tried to assemble into teams. And the basic idea of it is quite similar, as simple. You'll see some slides later on where basically, in fact, I'm going to just jump to those slides to show you what it looks like. Yeah, so this is the slide. Yeah, so this is what it looks like. You first, you respond to personal surveys. So it's not unlike what you would do for a dating profile where you answer a bunch of questions. But in addition to us answering personality questions, we also ask them about their networks. So if this is being done in a classroom situation, for example, we might say, oh, you know, tell us, uh, or in a lab, uh, tell us all the people that you worked with previously, uh, who you've enjoyed working with, who you enjoyed hanging out socially with. So if we can get their networks in addition to how well, you know, what experiences they've had in leadership, their personalities, a bunch of different things that we think are important for people to think through when they're working on teams. And then on the second, on the right hand side, what you see is that after everyone has answered the personal survey on the left hand side, then you go in there and then you put your preferences. I'd like to be on a team where my teammates are people that I have previously worked with, for instance, or maybe you'll say, I want to work with friends of friends, or you might say, I want to work with people who have complementary personality skills to me, or I like to be the leader of the team, so I'm more interested in people who are not interested in, who are, themselves don't want to be leaders, because otherwise we'll have too many leaders fighting each other. Uh, and so we can ha have a bunch of those kinds of questions, and that's the that sets up the query. And then we get a set of results from the query that tells you here are the people that met, met your match. So if you see on the left-hand side here, It'll show you that, you know, here are the people based on your preferences. It tells you exactly what criteria they were matched on. So in this case, it says, I'm telling you, Brian was at the top of the list because you said you wanted somebody who had good presentation skills, was interested in finance and interested in the sports sector. These were the three things that made this person really important. And then you can also send an invitation to that person. That person gets an email like the one on the right-hand side. 
and they can decide whether they want to join you on a team. If you are already on a team with someone else, it'll actually tell that person that if you accept this invitation that's coming to you from A, you should be aware that A is already on a team with B so that the person won't be surprised that they have accepted the invitation. All of a sudden, they're working with another person. And likewise, B will also be told that A has sent an invitation to someone else and B also needs to approve of that invitation being sent so that it's, a, it's seen as a collective decision. So this is the platform that we had. So we began to do the first study on looking at who invited whom on this platform. And we did this connect, collecting data from a class that was taught across two universities and across two disciplines, uh, environmental ecology and social psychology. One university was in the US, the other university was in France. And the team was required to have members from both universities, from both disciplines. And the goal of the class project was to simulate an advertising campaign to mitigate an environmental sustainability issue. And so we collected data for two consecutive years as part of a previous NSF project. And in each case, the participants assembled into teams over the course of one week using the My Dream Team platform that we just saw. In the first year, there were 213 who assembled into 32 teams. In the second year, there were 197 who assembled into 31 teams. So I've already shown you these questions. So in this case, the network that we were looking at was who invites whom. It's a directed graph. And we simply wanted to say who is likely to invite whom. We know from previous work that we will invite people who have the skills. So that goes without saying. So we put that as a control in the, in the model. We also know that there is a strong propensity for homophily in terms of gender. People like to invite others of the same gender. So we put that as a control variable. We also know from previous research that people are more likely to invite those who they have previously collaborated with. So we put that into the model. We didn't put that as a control variable, and you'll see in a minute why. And then the last um, hypothesis, or the most important one that we were in, not the most, but the most curious we were, is if we give people a list of recommendations on the technology, like the one I showed you previously, you know, so and so ranks at the top of your list. Are people going to really take this seriously? Are people, so in other words, if that if a particular name shows up on the top 10 recommendations, are those people going to be significantly more likely to be invited just by virtue of the fact that they showed up at the top of the recommendation list? So what did we find? First, we found what I just what I it confirmed what I just said, that if in fact a name showed up at the top 10 recommendation, then systematically in both the samples, in both the years that we collected data, people who showed up on the top 10 recommendation were definitely significantly more likely to be invited. Bottom line, people are paying attention to the technology. The second hypothesis we said is, are you more likely to invite somebody with whom you have previously collaborated with? No surprise here again, we found that in both samples, they were significantly more likely to invite someone they'd previously collaborated with. But if I go back to this model here, there was a third hypothesis that we put, which was an interaction hypothesis, which said, how likely are you to invite somebody who shows up on that recommendation list if you already knew that person previously versus if you did not know that person previously? So in other words, is the recommendation based the, that the technology is giving you, is that going to be much more influential, give much more of a lift if you knew the person, or is it going to give much more of a lift if you did not previously know that person? And what we found was that there was a negative interaction effect. What does this mean? It means that this is what the data looked like. The x-axis out here, the horizontal axis, is the first category is if your name was not on the top 10 list. The second was if it was on the top 10 list. The blue line says, this is the odds of inviting someone if you had not previously collaborated with them. The red line is the odds of you inviting someone if you had previously collaborated with. So the vertical axis here is the odds of inviting someone. The higher you are on this, the more likely you are to be invited. So it's not surprising that amongst, when you looked at the names that were not in the top 10, that those who you previously collaborated with were much more likely to be invited than those you did not previously collaborate with. 
But what becomes interesting is that as you go to the top 10 ranking, what you find is that if you had previously collaborated with that person, if the person shows up on the top 10, you see there is a bit of a lift here. It goes from the one on the left to this point here. But what is remarkable is if you look at the bottom here, if you were not on the top 10 list and you did not collaborate with someone, you are very unlikely to be invited. But the moment that person who you did not previously collaborate with was on the top 10 list, this lift here was much higher. So the takeaway here is that if you are talking that you're more likely to rely on the technology to uh, make a recommendation, if that recommendation is for someone that you did not previously collaborate with, that if you have previously collaborated with someone, you're going to moderate the value of the technology because you have personal data that is going to be very important in terms of deciding that. So it's not much of a surprise, but it does show an interesting way of seeing how the technology is merging, is, is playing uh, in when you already know somebody versus when you don't know somebody. So we found that in the second case. So now what we began to do was we said, yeah, this so far what we have done is simply seen how they make choices. And we know that people don't make diverse choices. In fact, that was one of the control variables we did, right? We put homophily in there and we found people were looking at them. So our goal was, given that there's research done by, by a lot of people, but certainly Scott Page, who wrote a book called uh, The Difference and then had another book on the diversity uh, payoff, uh, uh, they, he found that if you look at groups, that are very similar to one another, homogeneous groups. And you look at heterogeneous groups that are very different, that have a lot of different people in it. And you ask them to engage in certain creative activities. What he found, which was a little surprising, and uh, it may not be what, you, what I'm going to say, may not be what you think I'm going to say. It turns out that the heterogeneous groups are not more creative than the homogeneous groups. So in on average, they were just as creative as the, the, the homogeneous and the heterogeneous groups was. But what Scott found, which is interesting, is that while the average remains the same, the heterogeneous groups have a much greater variance in the creativity of the groups. To, that is to say, some of those heterogeneous groups will be super creative and others will just burn down and be, will be terrible. While the homogeneous groups will all be on the average. So they'll all be in the middle somewhere. They won't be super creative and they won't crash and burn. They'll just be, mod, you know, average. But what that means is that if you want to increase the likelihood of being creative, you need to be able to take the risk associated with heterogeneous groups because that's the only way you're going to get it. You may not get it, but if you are going to get it, that's the only way you're going to get it. And so what we did was we said, okay, well, why don't we provide a condition where we provide what we called an informational nudge? That is, we tell people, if you were to put this person in your team, this person will either increase or decrease the diversity of your team on this dimension by X percentage. And our goal was if we just give them that nudge, that little information, as they're looking at the recommendation, as they're, as they're looking at the search results, then that might give them an opportunity to make their team more diverse by inviting people who are increasing the diversity score for the team. So that was the informational nudge that we talked about, which is on the left-hand side here that you see. And, and the text literally said something to the effect like adding X to your team will change the diversity of your team on Y dimension by plus or minus whatever percentage. And then we actually, you'll see in a minute, we had a bar graph that looks, so the original one looked like this, where they just listed what uh, the criteria were to match it. We changed this to look something like this, where now you see that in addition to the FIT score, we included a diversity estimate score, which basically shows what their diversity was and then how it would change. And then we said that the top contributors to change in your team diversity in this case would be politics, writing, and statistics. So these were cognitive diverse skills that were being added to this team, that if you brought this person in, they will have skills that you don't have. And so they will increase the diversity of your skill. So 
what we did was we did a study where we did a control group and then we did this treatment condition that you're seeing here where they were given the informational nudge. And our expectation was that we would be, so this was data we collected in one, in one study was in Argentina, one at a, at a Big Ten university in the Midwest United States, um, where, where we give each of them the control condition, the treatment condition. And our hypothesis, of course, was that in the condition where they were given the informational nudge, the people would form teams that were more diverse because they had that information about those people. Well, it turns out that exactly the opposite happened, which is the high level is simply to say that those teams that were created in the platform, which provided uh, individuals with information about whether somebody was increasing or decreasing the diversity, those the, uh, the teams in that particular condition turned out to be much less diverse <laughs> than the teams where they didn't get any information at all, which is exactly the opposite of what we had predicted. <laughs> and so this was pretty depressing, right? 49% 49 less likely to invite someone who will increase diversity than someone who will reduce it. And so we failed miserably in terms of being able to answer that question. Yes, Mia, go ahead. Mila, go ahead. Yeah, so I this is very interesting. And I, I just wanted to ask what kind of tasks did these teams then need to do? Because if it's kind of, I think that it really depends on what kind of like, if it's um something that you need to come up with some very creative um, yeah. idea, then diverse yeah. team can be beneficial. But if right. there is something that you need to kind of like, fulfill a task really efficiently, then it, I don't know, it might be, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, we, I actually, I was trying to see if we had it here. So they, we, we, they actually were asked to do multiple tasks. And the tasks that we used were based upon the, um, um, were, were based upon the something called the, uh, so one of them was, they, uh, this one was a creativity task. You're seeing it right there. They were asked to design recruitment materials for an NGO. Okay, but we also asked them to do separate tasks. Uh, so we, so in essence, we set set them up to do one of the tasks was you need to do a startup company, put together a team for a startup company. Another one was put together a team for a political campaign to mobilize uh, a campaign. In this particular case, the task was a creativity task. Uh, specifically, they were being asked to design recruitment materials for an NGO. So. Yes, in this case, you are absolutely right. And for those, uh, what I was mentioning earlier is uh, Joe McGrath had created this thing called the task circumplex, which in the people who study teams, that's their Bible. So they take all that particular circumplex that McGrath came up with is uh, set into multiple dimensions that basically captures almost any kind of task that you that you might want to do, whether it's a creativity task, whether it's a negotiation task, whether it's a task that has a right answer that you're trying to solve. Um, and so if you're if you're not familiar with it, I think that would be a very good place to see how you can organize it. So it's McGrath, Joe McGrath, and it's called the task circumplex. Uh, circumplex. Um, so yes, but in this particular case, it was a creativity task that you see out here. So you would expect them to create diverse teams and we found the opposite. So then if you saw, I said we did another condition that we call the algorithmic nudge. So here we cheated. We, we did not tell them, we did not give them an information nudge. But when they gave us the search query and said, I want somebody who does X, Y, and Z, and who may be a friend of a friend, and so on and so forth. We took those search results. But then um, what we did was uh, we tweaked the ordering in which they showed up by taking the search queries that they had, the search results based upon what the match was to their query, but then weighting it by diversity. So that if two people looked equally good in terms of matching the search query, the one that got the higher ranking on the recommendation list was the one that increased the diversity score. So, you know, talk about the ethical issues that was brought up earlier. Here is another example of something that we know that companies are doing all the time in terms of how they are, you know, uh, changing the ordering. But this is what we did in this case. We're, but in this case, what we did was, so let me show you how, where we, I think we, 
yeah, so this is where we combine the query score with the diversity score. You see the product here. And so now we call this an algorithmic nudge because what we had done was we had reordered the results rather than providing them an informational nudge where we told them that so-and-so will increase the diversity. Here we didn't tell them anything. We just reordered the search results. And now what we wanted to see was in this particular case, will teams that saw that ha that were in this condition, will they now create more diverse teams? And lo and behold, we found that they do. So when they were not told that so-and-so would increase your diversity, but the diversity score was baked into the algorithm, we find that this, the, the y-axis here is the diversity of the team. And we see that the algorithmic nudges condition resulted in teams that had much higher diversity than those who only received the informational nudge. What are these two on the left here? The orange one here on the left is random teams. If we just assign teams randomly, it's not surprising that they will have a pretty high level of diversity. The green one here was actually one that used a genetic algorithm, the one that's on the top right here. So we use this particular non-dominated sorting genetic algorithm, and we use that to form teams that maximized identity diversity, that is demographic diversity, as well as cognitive diversity. So in this case, uh, they didn't get a chance to, they, they were not able to, they had no agency, but we just put them into teams that maximize that. I'll come to Mark, I'll come to you in a second. And so what we found here was that not surprisingly, the algorithm that was used to maximize diversity worked the best. So this is no surprise. We would expect that an algorithm that was trying to maximize the diversity of the team was in fact creating teams that had the maximum amount of diversity. So the green one is high. And right before I go to Mark, then we ask the next question. This is telling you whether they created under these different conditions, how diverse was the team that was created? The next question is, well, did these diverse teams perform well? Which of these teams performed the best? And here we were in for uh, uh, something that was a confirmation and something that was a surprise. The algorithmic nudges, which did create teams that were more uh, diverse than the informational nudges, also significantly outperformed the informational nudges. So they did much better in performance. So the algorithmic nudge where we weighted the score they both created more diverse teams and those diverse teams performed better. On the other hand, this, this uh, non-sorting genetic algorithm that we use to not give people agency, but just put them into teams that maximize diversity, they did create diverse teams, but they performed the worst. So, and that's because if you don't give people agency sometimes and you force them to be in teams that are super diverse, then they can they might crash and burn. I'll stop there. Mark, you've been patient. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, do I understand it correctly that the, the uh, characteristics, how they sort of um, identified themselves by based on which the diversity was sort of uh, taken later? So were they like pre-assigned uh, labels sort of things? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, that's a good question. So what we what we had done was remember that on the when they answered their profile question, we were asking them about their skill sets. So it is arguably uh, and potentially problematically <laughs> self-reported skill sets. They were telling us whether they were good at web analytics or whether they were good at presentation or good at writing or whatever it is, right? Or Python, for example. So we were using their self-report of their skill sets as a way of judging the diverse cognitive diversity. And then identity diversity was based on their self-reported demographics. So things like um, gender, uh, majors, special area that they were doing, uh, age, um, ethnicity. So all of those were used also as ways of measuring diversity. I thought that's so, kind of yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I thought um, so this is sort of when there is already a core team and you add additional people, right? So what if you self-select into, like this is what's happening when you're, say, a PhD student or a postdoc or a faculty uh, applying into a situation that is more or yes. less multidisciplinary, for example. So yes. how if the entire team is sort of, 
brought together by people who um, desire diversity. I'm thinking about Michael Macy's result of, um, you know, sort of open-minded people all moving to Alston, Boston, and then they end up in houses full of Germans, Koreans, and Chinese people, seg more segregated than otherwise. So is that something, like, like what if, if basically the entire team self-selects to be uh, diverse from the scratch? But I was not part of this experiment, but is the, do, you, do you know any version? I, I, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And I think that there, you know, in our in our case, what we were getting was the tendency of uh, overall tendencies. I think the one example you're talking about is where there may be some people who, um, and it's sort of a meta comment, and that is that some people are similar in that they are diverse, that they have a preference for diversity. So the homophily is about diversity, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's the situation that Michael was describing. And so in some, way, in some senses, you can have people who all, what they have in common is the desire to not work with people who look like them. And then you get those teams. That is not what we had been studying here, right? Because we were not asking them, we were asking them about their own skill sets. We were not asking them about their strategies for picking other people. But if we, but I think what you're describing is exactly that. And I think that's an interesting area to, to ask people about what their strategies were in this particular case. Um, the question is how honest are people going to be about it? Because quite frankly, the reason we were surprised about that st initial study where we said giving people a diversity score makes them choose less diverse people, we would have never expected that. And I think it's because while in principle, we all say that we would like to have a diverse things, a diverse teams, but behind the scenes, when people had to make choices, they chose to ignore that, systematically chose to ignore that, which is somewhat depressing, but also not just depressing about human nature, but I think also suggests that self-report data about how we go about selecting teammates can sometimes be a little deceptive. That we may not act, we and not not intentionally deceptive, but we just may not be conscious about what our subconscious is doing when it comes to making these decisions. But again, that's a really good question. So anyway, so the bottom line here is just to summarize: people assembled into that people when they were given informational nudges, people assembled into less diverse teams. When they were given algorithmic nudges, people assembled into more diverse teams. And those more diverse teams perform better than teams assembled by informational nudges. Vajun, you have a question. Uh, yes, thanks, Nashir. Um, actually, when you were talking about uh, self-assessment, um, I was thinking if you looked at all into that, how, how people did self-assess themselves. For instance, did people from more diverse backgrounds assess themselves uh, more poorly or so on? Because I know there was research that, for instance, when women apply to uh, jobs, they usually self-assess themselves poorer than men do and so on. And I was thinking if, if maybe you looked into that. That's a very good question. And the short answer is we have not. We did not look into that. I At least not that I'm aware of. But you're absolutely right. Uh, and there are what we have been looking at right now. Uh, so, the, yes, great point. I, and, and I think we have the data. So much, we can just go back and analyze it to see if they would, in fact, have done that, right? I think that that's an easy uh, piece of analysis that we could do on data that we've already collected. One of the reasons we see that as problem, I mean, we see the same problem that you see is because self-report may not always be accurate. So right now we are in the midst of launching another study. Diego and myself are again working with the group that we worked with in Argentina. And we are launching uh, a new study with the same uh, general platform uh, that will happen over the course of one year where the students will be, it's actually faculty members who are involved in a continuing education program, but they will be uh, doing this, they'll be using the platform to assemble into teams for nine consecutive projects over the course of a year. And because the same people are going to be doing it on multiple locations, for the first time, what we are doing is after they assemble the first time, then before they assemble the second time, we are asking people who were on the teams at the first time to rate one another so that we get peer ratings of the people. So that it's not just your own self-report, but now it's also the ratings that are being given by others on it. 
which arguably can be more accurate because, you know, I might brag that I'm really good at Python, but everyone who worked with me on that first course will say, he's crappy at Python. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And so we are <laughs> hoping that that will factor in and remove some of the self biases, for example, that women might have of rating themselves lower. Um, but yeah, so that's what we are trying to do and see if we are able to um, to get higher quality uh, ratings. It's it's like, you know, I mean, it's it's not very different from what we do on restaurants. You know, the restaurant can tell you how great they are, but then the reason we go to places like Yelp and others is because it's what other people say the restaurant is, and we have not been doing that. We've been relying only on self report till now. So yeah, that's that's the short and long answer to your question. But it's a very, very good question. And I'll have to go back and take a look to see whether we see those biases amongst uh, minorities of one kind or another. Okay, so then let me touch very quickly how we're doing on time. Okay, so we have about, about a little over half hour. I'm going to just give you one more example on team staffing. Um, and this example comes from work we are doing in space. So um, this is, again, a large group of people, some of them similar, uh, the names that you've seen previously, but also we are working with uh, uh, Alina Lungianu, who um, was a former student, but now faculty member at Northwestern, uh, Brennan, who is a former student who just started at Cornell as a faculty member there, and Suzanne Bell, who, when we began to work with her, was a professor in, at DePaul in Chicago, uh, but now actually has gone to work full-time at NASA on topics very related to what I'm just about to talk to you about. So it turns out that a big area of where we are been asked to make a contribution is how do we uh, st uh, staff the crews that are going to go on these on these long duration space missions. So we all know that humans are about to become an interplanetary species and that in the next decade or so, there is very likely going to be a mission to Mars. Uh, and the challenges of going to Mars are quite significant because the International Space Station, ISS, is orbiting the Earth at 250 miles above the Earth, which is not very far if you look at it in terms of uh, road trips that we might take in the US, in, in, you know, in Europe or anywhere between two big cities that are more than 250 miles away. If you go to the moon, that's 250,000 miles from Earth. But if you go to Mars, it's 250 million miles from Earth. And just to give you the orders of magnitude. And what that does is that, uh, first of all, because of the way the orbital dynamics work, you notice that the Earth and Mars don't are not close to each other very often as they are orbiting the sun. And the only times when you can launch from Earth to Mars or vice versa is when they are pretty close. And you can see that in the little picture about when it's most likely that someone will be sending that. See, there goes the the spacecraft from Earth to Mars, for example. And that's one of the reasons why all the launches happen in very small windows of time uh, that they can be sent. Uh, and then they take about a year to get there. And that, and that new window will only open about once every year. So you have to wait a year before you can come back. So we are talking about a three-year mission. And that in addition to just being a three-year mission, as you get farther away from Earth, the amount of time based on the laws of physics that it'll take for a message from Earth to get to Mars is going to be as much as 22 minutes. So those of you who are old enough to remember the famous uh, quotation from Apollo 13, which said, Houston, we have a problem, uh, that can no longer be a relevant issue because when if someone in, in on Mars tells Houston that they have a problem, the problem will have long, son, long since been uh, become much worse if you wait for 42, 44 minutes for a round trip for a just a back and forth message to go. So that means that these teams have to work with a great degree of autonomy. And as a result, NASA, for the first time in their internal reports, had so far only focused on human behavior performance being at risk in terms of gravitation or in terms of risk in terms of uh, um, radiation. Uh, now, all of a sudden said that if we are going to Mars, as you see in the bottom right corner, that if you're having trips going to Mars, all of a sudden, teamwork in teams becomes a very, very high risk situation. And that's when they approached people like myself and others to help them understand how we can learn about building models to predict how a team would do. So the short answer, what I'm going to tell the short preview of what I'm going to talk about here is if you tell me who is going to Mars, 
uh, give me the names of the four people. How likely uh, can I build a model that will essentially work like a weather forecast and say, yeah, these people are going to be able to do it properly, as opposed to, oh, you're going to have a disaster on your hands. Or we can tell you that on such and such a day, uh, Mila and Abdullah are going to really have a big argument with each other. So you want to make sure that you keep them apart, for example. And that's essentially the story I'm going to leave you with here. So not surprisingly, what I've just said to you is as a risk, as a risk uh, was borne out by this comment by a Russian cosmonaut who says, if you shut two people in a cabin, then, you know, it's you're definitely setting it up for murder in this particular case. Uh, we, this is not the first time we've had to deal with it when people had to go to uh, Antarctica. Uh, Ernest Shackleton had this ad where in, to trying to get people to go. And it said things like for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete danger, constant danger, uh, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe, safe return, doubtful, and honor and recognition in the event of success. Well, guess who are the people who applied for his job? The people who applied for his job were essentially turned out to be people who were defic deficient in social skills, because these were people who were like, you know, I have nothing to lose. I don't have any friends. I'm a loner out here. I'm sitting in Europe. What the hell? I might as well go on this and maybe we'll get successful and I'll be part of history. And so for a long time, people who engaged in these kinds of high risk activities were not the socially skilled kinds. Then, of course, we came into the space mission, and the first people who went into space were those who were part of what is called the Mercury 7. So these were essentially daredevil, almost every single, not, not almost, every single one of these were what were called test pilots, fighter pilots who were, who were doing test pilots. And essentially, the only quality that they needed, this book called The Right Stuff, talked about what were the qualities of these Mercury 7 uh, astronauts. And the main quality was that these people were daredevil, you know, very, very high risk people, because essentially they were like human bullets who were being put into the cannon and shot into space through the Mercury capsule. Uh, and that's not today what is required, because after Mercury came Gemini, where you had two people who had to work together, Apollo, where you had three people who had to work together. Then we had the space shuttle, where you had a large number of people, five, six, seven people on a space shuttle mission. And then, of course, now the space station, where you have a continually a much larger number of people. And it's not surprising that as you look at what people report in their diaries of those who go to the space station, they say things like, oh, my commander is brilliant at knowing the perfect balance of fun with professionalism. In fact, Peggy Whitson, who was the, uh, who's been one of the most, uh, who spent more time in space than almost any other astronaut, man or woman, uh, when she became the chair of the astronaut selection board in 2009, she actually said that uh, people that she changed the criteria for in order to be an astronaut. I don't think the I don't know whether the audio will work. So let me see if it'll work. Oh, it's it was really. Can you hear me? Question. Can you hear it? When I read yes. the selection board, we actually changed the emphasis of the crew members we were looking for. We had thousands of applicants that were technically competent. And we started looking more for those that uh, got the box checked from the report card that says plays well with others. <laughs> because for long duration missions, that had much more of an emphasis for us. So again, you know, that all of a sudden our teamwork became important. Uh, Captain Scott Kelly, who also spent a lot of time in space, actually said when he came back, he said, teamwork makes the dream work at NASA. And, and again, more Jessica Meyer, who we interviewed, she came back recently from the space station. As part of our project, we get to debrief and have a debrief interview with uh, astronauts when they return from the space station. And here is a quote from Jessica saying, some, you know, we want someone that contributes to the team, helps with group tasks, someone that is good natured and pleasant to be around, someone who's fun. So our general question was, given everything we know, can we predict how team networks will change over time, and how can we use the network model to, to intervene in the team? So the example that I was giving you, if two people are not going to get along, can we fix the problem? So uh, before we got into this, almost all the work that was done by NASA was only, and all the work done by psychologists who were interested in teams was done at that individual analytics, where they looked at style, personality, and saw if they could use that to predict who will get along with whom on teams. 
We took a slightly different approach where we were building computational models to that's included things like personality, but also included the effect of networks on future networks, for example. And we asked a question, with whom do you enjoy working and who makes tasks difficult to complete? So these are the kinds of network questions that we were interested in asking. And of course, what we also did was, of course, we have to, you, the question that you must be going through your mind is, okay, how can you do research and build models about people going into space when no one has gone into space for that long? So where do we get our data from? Well, we can ask ourselves, you know, so we built the whole theoretical model based on all the things that we think would affect uh, uh, so, so crew relationships, et cetera. And then, of course, the, the way we collected the data was we measured it in places like this. So I, I'm going to, I'm just in the interest of time, I'm going to take away the suspense. But if you look at this picture on the right hand side here, that is a facility, it's called HERA, the Human Exploration Research Analog. That's a facility that actually sits at the Johnson Space Center in, um, in, in, in uh, Houston at NASA. They put people in there for 45 days at a time and they close the doors and we get to study them. They do everything we ask them to do. They answer our surveys. They engage in our creative activities. They do anything we ask them to do. And we can essentially physiologically and psychologically poke and prod them. So I have a set of slides that I'm going to skip over. But essentially, if you ask someone, oh, we'll just put people into confinement and you know, collect all kinds of data for a long period of time, no IRB in this country will ever approve that. The Institutional Review Board will never approve that as a study, but that is actually what exactly what we are doing out here. And um, if you look at it, we have NASA, the one I just showed you was this picture on the right-hand side. This is what it looks like on the inside. And NASA is not the only one doing it. The Chinese have a similar facility that they have to study people in solitary confinement. They call it the Lunar Palace. The Russians have this facility called NEK. In fact, the Russians, have, until the Ukraine crisis, the Russians and NASA have been collaborating very closely. And we actually collected data, my team, collected data from a group of six people who were put into a facility in this in this facility in Moscow. And um, it was, they were there for 240 days in solitary confinement. And before that, we collected data from a previous mission where they were in there for 120 days. So that's where we get the data from. And because we can get high resolution data from them, we are able to build some really complex models in this fashion. So Leo's an example of the network data we get. So this particular data is real data that was collected from the very first mission we studied in Johnson Space Center. It was at the time only a 30 day mission, not even 45 days. And if you look at it, the quest, the network on the top asks the question, with whom do you work effectively? And you can see that there's a lot of bi-directional green links, which basically says that these people tended to enjoy working with each other, by and large. That's great. But look at the question at the bottom. Who makes tasks difficult to complete? And now if you look at the longitudinal data, so this data were collected every few days over the 30-day period, you begin to see that this poor person at the bottom here is very quickly the object of everyone saying that they don't enjoy working with this person. And you see that gets consistent. And this person seems to have no idea that, they, that other people don't enjoy working with this person. This is real data. And so our question was, could we have predicted that this person was going to be seen as difficult to work with by the teammates? And if we could have, would we be able to tell someone about it before the mission actually started? And so we essentially did just that. We collected these data over a large period of time uh, because we we would, you know, people would be there for 30 days. We would collect the data, they'll come out, then they'll put a new people, new batch would go in there again for 30 days. And then they began to do it for 45 days. And then, as I said, in Moscow, we were collecting it for 120 days and 240 days. So we used NetLogo to build agent-based models. But the difference with our agent-based models was we didn't come up with our own parameters. We as estimated the parameters of the model using the data. So we used a feature in ABMs called behavior search, which is a set of genetic algorithms 
that essentially estimates parameters from your empirical data, which is very different from most agent-based models where you decide what the parameter weight is going to be. But we were able to do that because we had so much of data that we had actually collected. And essentially what we were able to find is we would get results that look like this. And one of the parameters, for example, that we found was something called self-monitoring. Self-monitoring is a scale of, as an individual personality scale. And basically what it means is um, that I would, I would score high on self-monitoring if I can look around an audience and be able to monitor accurately whether the audio, how the audience is engaging with me. So if I were to look around right now and see that everyone is bored to death, and I know that people are bored to death by my presentation, then I would be a high self-monitor, assuming I'm accurate. Um, but a person who's low on self-monitoring is clueless about what other people are thinking. Okay, that's that's the main my. And what we find here is that a person who is high on self-monitoring is likely to be somebody who other people enjoy working with, but and also a person who is low on self-monitoring is somebody who other people will think of as a hindrance. So that example I gave you of that person at the bottom of the network who everyone else saw that as a hindrance, partly it was because that person had low self-monitoring. That person had no idea that others were looking at that person as a hindrance. So again, the nice thing is it's intuitively accurate, but now we have actual parameter numbers that came from the data that tell us exactly how much this particular variable or all the other variables matter. Another example would be cumulative workload. That basically says this is a negative value. It basically says that when somebody feels that they've got a lot of backlog, they're under a lot of workload, they're very, very likely to just say, I don't enjoy working with anyone. That's why the negative score, that they will just say, I don't enjoy working with anyone. Uh, and that again makes sense. So basically, as we build this model, we then went and began to see again the same training and testing that we did previously with, you know, using uh, digital trace data to predict survey data. We use the same logic here, and essentially what we found was that uh, these models were very uh, overall. We did a good job. That if you look at the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of the precision and recall, overall we were able to. Uh, our model did a pretty good job of predicting who was going to get along with whom, who was going to be the leader for whom, who was a hindrance. The hindrance was the worst. Uh, and part of the reason why we didn't do a good job on hindrance is because uh, the good news for these crews was that it was not very common to see hindrance. That's good news for the crews. It's bad news for us as researchers because we didn't have enough instances of variability. In we didn't have enough cases of hindrance for, our, to, for us to build a good model in this area. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't do a very good job of predicting hindrance, even though we did okay in it, but not as good as we can. So, you know, when we presented this to NASA, uh, after we studied about six or seven of these missions, uh, we, we kept trying to improve the model, but then our model was good enough. We didn't really need to do more. So we went to NASA and said, you know, we don't need to collect, continue collecting these data because I think we've done a pretty good job of being able to predict it. And they came back to us and says, that's great, but it's not enough for you to tell us that Mila and Abdullah are not going to get along on day 23. I want you to go fix the problem. So that's the next thing I'm going to talk about. But Max, I'm going to take your question first. Yeah, I'm, uh, I have a, a very simple question. So there, yeah. there's obviously, you said there's precedent. And indeed, I mean, there is lots of precedent in history, right? Like, um, you know, ships going around the planet, like with James Cook or Fitzcarraldo and stuff like that. Um, obviously, there may be bias in literature about things that didn't go so well. Yeah. Also, to me, halfway to Mars doesn't really work and stuff. But yeah. so... In how much do you think uh, these kind of tropes that come out of history are important to actually um, see phenomena uh, that uh, may not come out of your data? Because your, your, your experiment is a sort of very straightforward psychological controlled experiment, while um, other people who have uh, thought about going to Mars um, you know, have thought about like, you know, what, what what kind of religion will people have? Will they come yeah. up as one by themselves and stuff like that? Like Solaris and like all the all sorts of science fiction stories. So how do you how do you 
uh, sort of like interweave what you're doing here in a very straightforward manner with these kind of uh, mythologies, which very clearly sort of like uh, shaped the public imagination about, you know, it's like if, you, if I listen to you, I get a very different story than if I listen sort of to people who are fan, still fans of Elon Musk on Twitter going to Mars, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I no, I, I think that th that's that's those are very fair questions. And I will not I, I will not pretend that our models are certainly taking those into account. I mean, we take basic things into account, like what we find, for example, is that civilians uh, tend to uh, have very different styles of being in teams as compared to those who've had a military background. Mm -hmm. uh, so we found things of that kind. But this idea of, you know, what if you were to come up with some new issue that comes up like religion, as you said, not, yeah, I think that there's no way our model is, is going there. And I think that those, this is one of the reasons why I, again, say this, you know, in this case, it's not network science fiction, but it's a different form of network science fiction. It's science fiction and networks that are merging in this way. What I will say is that from that Russian mission, uh, the mission in, in Moscow, the 240 day mission, one of the interesting things we learned from that um, is that it turns out that there was less division, cultural division between the Russians and the Americans as than what we would have thought because the crew for that mission was, they started out as six people of which three were Russians, two were Americans and one was an Emirati that were in that. Now it turns out that about uh, 90 days, less than 90 days into the mission, one of the people, one of the Russians, had an accident on their fitness cycle machine in the inside the simulation, and um, they were not able to fix the problem. And the situation got so bad that they actually had to take the person out. So that for most of the 240 day mission, they only had five people in there. The reason I'm bringing this up is because it when we we had extent we did uh, obviously we collected a lot of survey data from these people, but we also did exit interviews with each of them, and what we found was very interesting that there was a definite uh, factions in the group, and the person who had the injury and left was the one person who was holding the factions together, and when she was removed from it because of her injury. Then the entire crew broke into two factions and stayed as two separate factions for the rest of the 240 day mission. And what were the two factions? The two factions were one group of people who believed that, you know, they if they were told to do something, they had to do it. It was so important. They, they stayed up late. It doesn't matter if they didn't have any work life balance. It doesn't matter because they were told to do something and they would have to do it. The second group felt, look, life is too short. We will, you know, we'll just do what we can do. And then we, that's the end of the day and they'll have to wait. So deal with it. And interestingly, there was a Russian and an American on each of these camps. So the camp, it was not like the Russians felt one way and the Americans felt one way. There was one Russian and one American who were in the die hard, let's make sure we get everything done, dot our I's and cross our T's. And we cannot, if that means we don't sleep, we don't sleep. And then there was one Russian and one American who felt life is too short. We have to keep a balance on these issues. <clears throat> the person that didn't really belong to either of the two factions was the Emirati. That person kind of got along with both, but didn't really belong to a faction. So we do see those, and we didn't have that in our model. The reason I'm bringing this up is we did not have that particular ethos in a model, but our model still predicted that they would be these network ties, even though it took us the debriefing interviews to understand why that faction was happening, mm -hmm. which our data was not giving us. So uh, yeah, these are very limited, but these methodologies might be interesting in their own way to take a look at it. I just noticed that there is a, a chat thing that I, oh, there we go. Yeah, oh. Abdullah, you want to speak up? Yeah, go ahead, speak up, Abdullah. I just saw your message. I'm reading it, but go ahead. <clears throat> Yes. So, hello. Uh, very nice Hi. presentation. Um, out of curiosity, I was just wondering, like, uh, is there an optimal number of people that can work in a team, let's say, supposedly in uh, research work or in industry, let's say, like a team for a specific project? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So very, very good question. And there is an article that has been written on exactly this topic and looked at it historically. The article was written by uh, by the one of the lead authors on it was one of my colleagues at Northwestern, Louis Amaral. So Louis Amaral wrote an article and it was published. I can't remember whether it was PNAS or science, but it was exactly on this topic. And what they found, which was interesting, is that the optimal number of people on a team has actually increased over the last several decades. So what that their first finding was that now we know that in scientific collaborations, we work more in teams than others, but Lewis's work looked at a lot of different types of teams. And basically what they argued was that perhaps because of technologies that have reduced coordination costs, uh, we now have, we have the ability to be in larger teams uh, and, and overcome some of the coordination costs because why don't we be in large teams, right? Because it's it's essentially a network question. The number of potential connections between n nodes is n times n minus one, right? Because each of the n nodes can connect to n minus one other nodes. So that's n squared minus n. So it's basically of the order of n squared. But if there are, uh, so part of what they, what Lewis found is that that number has actually been drifting upwards somewhat slowly, but it has been drifting upwards. Now, we were asked by NASA specifically to answer that question that you asked as well as a separate, uh, as a corollary project, because there is some debate about how many people should go to Mars, whether it should be uh, three, four, five. So one issue there is the odd versus even number, right? And because the uh, the moment you have an odd number, then you can break, uh, you can break uh, sort of the, you know, you, you can have coalitions. While if you have an even number, then you run the risk of creating a real deadlock. Uh, so the general tendency is, how do you decide that? And so um, I, 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 in, our, in the work that we did, we did a series of simulations where the other factor that we were finding is that as you get larger teams, on the one hand, you can say you benefit from the fact that more people will do the work and so you can get more accomplished. However, what we found in our experiments was that as you were in a larger team, there was a greater tendency for you to engage in what is called as free loafing. That is, you assume that someone else will take care of it so you don't have to work quite as hard. So that's the trade-off that on the one hand, you can say that having more people uh, will benefit in terms of getting things done. But if people are going to start essentially um, thinking that they don't have to work so hard, that's the downside. And of course, the reason NASA is interested in is that each time you add one more person, all the extra payload weight that is created by having one more person and getting the food purse for that person and getting all the supplies for that person goes up. So they are trying to strike that right balance between having enough people, but not too many in that case. Uh, but it is definitely something that... Um, um, matters a lot in those conditions where there are constraints in terms of weight, etc. I see two hands up, Mark and Mike. So I'm gonna. I I'm not sure which hand went up first, but I'll let you all decide. And then I think we may be getting ready to wrap up here, anyway. So yeah, exactly. So we got <clears throat> ten more minutes. So please, both Mike and um, yeah. Mark, keep it short. Thank you. Yeah, basically, I wanted to 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 say two very short things. One that. Uh, it is probably not particularly relevant for the for the uh, space travel, but for um, scientific teams, I think there was this, this work by uh, commentary people, Raf Kenda and uh, others, which particularly studied the, the optimal size of of teams, and it turns out that it is very different in very in different fields. Uh, that that optimal size of a team in pure mathematics is one. Yes, uh, but but in, in biology, <laughs> like fifteen people. And and the second question, which I'm not sure if you are, if you will be able to answer this one, uh, but just out of curiosity, uh, out of these Russian cosmonauts who worked with, uh, was there a Sergei Rizansky? Was there a what? Uh, a man called Sergei Rizansky that used to go to high school. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, I, 
A, I, I, I honestly don't remember the names, but if I did, I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to tell you. So oh, actually, you know what? no, 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 I, I, I take that back. I take that back because you can actually Google it because the name of this particular program is called uh, Sirius, S-I-R, I'll, I'll put it in, I'll, let me just go ahead and put it in the, let me see if I can find it here. Where are we? I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing here. Did I? <laughs> Did I lose the sharing? Or where, where is it? Am I still sharing? No, I stopped sharing, right? You're not sharing. I'm not sharing, correct? No, you're not sharing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if I go to, if you, if you, if I go to, if, if basically, if you, <clears throat> you can Google it and find this. I'm, this is not confidential, I, I realize now. The, the NASA ones are confidential, but the ones in the Russian <laughs> one, if you type in Sirius NEK, um, and I think it was, it was mission, 10, but if you type in S-I-R-U-S, that's called the Sirius is an acronym for a collaboration between Russia and the U.S. So that's where you get the Sirius from. And then if you also type in NEK, which is the name of their facility uh, in Moscow, I've been there actually, where, we, where I showed you the picture where we collected the data, they actually will list the names of all the crew members, which includes the Russians, the Americans and the Emirati. So you can check to see if your friend was one of the people on it. But they've been having missions. They've had three or four. They've had the big one was called Mars 500, which we didn't get to study. That was before I was part of it. And they put people in there for 500 days. Uh, one of the people in that particular mission is uh, uh, was an Italian, uh, Diego Urbina. And he's one of the people we actually interviewed. Uh, so, yeah. So th I think his name is Diego uh, Urbin, uh, Urbina or Urbino, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so now he's he works at the Europeans, works with the European Space Agency. And he was one of those in the Mars 500. That Mars 500 has a whole lot of interesting drama that happened that we don't have time to talk about. Uh, but that included an Italian, it included a Japanese, it included a Canadian. Um, and let me just say that unfortunate episodes and events happened as part of a New Year's Day celebration, a New Year's Eve celebration on the Mars 500 mission that uh, that that ended with one person leaving the, having to leave the thing. It was really not good. There was a lot of problems, but that's a separate story. Um, okay, Mark. <clears throat> yeah, yeah uh, so, so it's been about the, the study of group dynamics and the, I understand it as a, you know, separate field of study, but I, I had the curiosity of, uh, so how scalable it is in a sense and so on. What can you say about the sort of larger groups? So you might talk about, you know, this smaller groups of people and maybe go to sort of bigger social groups and, you know, then do the scale of civilization. So do, what have you been, do you have any thoughts? So how have you connected this? Is it applicable to like larger social scales, bigger cultures? Yeah, so we groups? actually have an article that we have published about this issue where we built this model um, and then applied it to slightly as part of the NASA grant. We built these models. Now, notice that we started out with uh, groups of four, but then we were looking at groups of six and in, in the case of the Russian collaboration. And then we also had this natural episode where a group of six became a group of five because one person was injured and had to leave. And so we have an article that uh, is published in LQ, Leadership Quarterly, where we ran simulations for a large number of groups as we vary the size. But, um, and I, I'll, all I can do in the, in the interest of time now is I can send you a citation to that. In fact, I might be able to find the citation while we're on the call. But the more important thing I wanted to mention before I forget it is that there is an implicit comment that you made that I want to challenge. And that is um, many who study teams don't believe that a team can actually be 20 people. At that point, it breaks down into smaller teams. And so there's a lot of work in teams that focuses on what is called as multi-team systems, that is teams of teams. And while in our mind, we can abstractly say, oh, why don't we scale up a team to 30 people or 40 people? People who study team, who are researchers in the teams area will often say, well, if you look, that team is not one team. That is actually a team of teams. And so from their point of view, um, you're actually not able to go much above, you know, 8, 10, 12, as the case may be. There's no cardinal number about it. 
but there is a tendency in which once you have a large number of people um, and you say that 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 no longer works as a team itself that becomes uh, broken down into teams of teams if you may um and they look at it that way but even within that same area there is still enough of variability that the the basic question that you've asked how well does it scale and how well do our models work and and we've applied that to see the extent to which as you increase the number of people on the team through simulations to what extent are you likely to see factions uh, develop? Um, and to what extent do you see that these coordination issues? So your basic question is the same. My challenge to you was only when you start thinking about teams that might be in the hundreds. Uh, and we know that in physics, you know, we have articles that are written by 300 people or, uh, or supposedly written by 300 people. And I can tell you that people who study teams just refuse to believe that that meets the definition of a team but they call it multi-team systems, teams of teams. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Noshir. And thank, thank you very you. much, everybody, for asking questions. So this was super fascinating, and the two hours passed way more quickly than we all thought, I guess. Uh, I, I I would have to say the same thing, because I, as as you know, I was uh, not sure about two hours, but your, your group is a very engaging group, and uh, I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed uh, just listening to those questions. So thank you all for taking time to, to, to meet with me on this, and yes. uh, I hope we will get a chance to meet in person. I know that we've already talked from time to time about uh, doing something in person. And now with travel restrictions being lifted, I certainly hope that I will get a chance to meet many of you uh, in person in the not too distant future. Yes, thank you very much. So um, I, I have always at the end of this, because it's also on the web, um, I have to say, what's the next one? Um, yes. In this particular case, like last week, there is actually um, a, a nice bridge. So next week, we will again talk about social systems and linguistics, actually, and in particular about statistical inference, which is not unrelated to your agent-based exactly. model, model. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we will have, uh, if we also stay uh, in Asia Pacific, we will have Eduardo Altman from yeah. the University of Sydney talking yep. about complex systems approaches to social data which also is closely related to crowds, which both of us are um, sort of related yep. to uh, because there is collaboration with Tiago Pesoto and stuff like that. So the network science is, is also there. Fantastic. And I hope that for everybody it becomes clear that this social dimension cannot be ignored both in terms of what the content of cultural data analytics is. So many of us come from fields where you know, we work with text, we work history is also text based, artifact based, art history, um, or even sort of, you know, intangible uh, materials such as semiotics. But yeah. there is the social dimension. And in particular, today we learned that we have um, obviously another subject of cultural analysis slash social science, which is ourselves as a team, because as we come together, we have this issue that indeed we ask ourselves the question, you know, it's like, is 12 people with 12 different disciplines a manageable size, for example. So thank you very much for taking us into that topic and for spending so much work with so many people and inspiring so many people across the planet, which is one very gets the opportunity to do so. Um, I find one of the most inspiring uh, sort of uh, models of like how you can be a researcher working with many, many, many different people uh, because in many disciplines, specialization is the maximum. Yeah. But yeah. what Nosher showed us today is that you can actually make a lot of progress by actually going to many different silos and bringing the interesting bits together. So thank you very much for all that. Thank you for those kind words and thank you all and have a good rest of the day. And bye-bye, uh, everyone, again. Thank you. Bye-bye.